warm welcome to all the participants for this month's Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture. Welcome to our distinguished speaker, Kiko Samuels. Uh, she's probably about to join. Uh, and uh, commentators, Dr. Shivani Sharma, Dr. Namrata Charles, and all participants, warm welcome everyone. Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series is a series of online lectures, e-talks, exploring intersectoral solutions for specific health problems. Health is an out outcome, influencer, and enabler of sustainable development, so do we believe. Welcome, friends, to this special episode of Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series, which features the talk by Kiko Samuels. Kiko was born in Tokyo, Japan. She's a retired psychotherapist from California, now lives in Daoi Sai Kate in Northern Thailand. She has worked with children with autism and those who deal with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, in Chiang Mai for several years now under neuro-optimal neurofeedback equipment. She is certified by Zenger Institute to operate the machine and a certified instructor to certify other people. Knowing early childhood intervention is crucial when working with brain, she focused on preschool and elemental school age children. She formed a charitable foundation educating autistic Chiang Mai EACM in 2016 so that she can train teachers and make neurofeedback training available to a wider population. Her mission is to improve autistic children's quality of life and create an autistic friendly society in Thailand. Before we listen to our invited guest speaker who will deliver this month's Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture, let me share briefly and pay tribute to late Mrs. Shanti Devi Shankar in whose memory this lecture is instituted. Mrs. Shanti Devi Shankar was born in rural parts of Uttar Pradesh, India, and despite back-breaking odds and challenges of social and economic inequalities fueled by gender disparities, she not only boldly confronted these stereotypes, but also lived her life by upholding these values and having a life-influencing impact on others. She passed away on 21st December 2006. Shanti Devi Memorial or SDM Health Justice Lecture Series feature noted health experts from around the world every month who have devotedly worked on specific health issues and interlinkages within health sector as well as between health and non-health sectors. The focus of each lecture is to explore solutions that require intersectoral collaboration for improving specific program outcomes. I would like to invite Keiko Samuel to present. Uh, probably she is uh, uh, she hasn't, yeah, she is online, that's great. So welcome Kiko, welcome Dr. Namrata, welcome Dr. Shivani, welcome everyone. Yes. Thank you for uh, your introduction. Uh, first, I wanna Thank say, you. am I online? You your... Everything's okay? Yes, you are online, we can hear you loud and clear. We also saw your film before we began the session. So, so okay. we are very relieved that you are online. Glad. Over to you now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Keiko Samuels. I live in Thai, uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. Th Chiang Mai is the second largest city in Thailand. And I've been here for 15 years. Um, I came from California where I worked as a psychotherapist and I thought I was going to retire and travel. However, I got pulled into working with autistic children in Chiang Mai and then ended up uh, <clears throat> building a foundation because I didn't want to just offer a service to rich children. The people who really need it more than anybody are the low income families who live in rural Thailand and many other cities. So um, let me first say a few things about what is neurofeedback because I don't really know where each one of you, uh, which country you're from, how much experience you have. But what I like to say to start off, whenever you don't understand something, please communicate through the facilitator, moderator, or chat box. I'm very happy to be interrupted. I can do that. So I, it's more important for me that you understand what you really want to know. So um, I want to show you what new, new feedback is like, because this is, this is the most state-of-the-art technology. It's a combination of 
neuroscience, you know, study of the brain and the imaging techniques, because we couldn't really directly see our brain until just recently. And then also computer technology that enables us to put everything like this in a laptop sized computer. I carry this around and go to the rural area of Thailand and go to schools and work with children. When I work with children, it looks like this. The child is sitting in a chair. You see the computer in the back. That's where all the software is. From that, they notice the child had the headphone. That is, he's listening to the music for 35 minutes. The only requirement is he needs to sit still. He cannot pull down all the hookups. And then you see the lines, cable coming from the uh, computer. That is, uh, there are two sensors on top of his head that's monitoring neural activities. What it does, it monitors the neural activities and goes into the software. Software analyzes what is going on and lets the brain know let the child know through the ear, through the audio, audio feedback, when it just, what it just has done. It teaches, it tells the brain how it is doing. So that's basically what neurofeedback uh, is. And uh, we work, um, we work with some very, let, let's see, the example is, this is the eight year old boy. He's considered to be severe autistic because he's nonverbal. He's got a severe sensory disorder issue. So he cannot stand the noise and touch. So he couldn't handle the hookup. But after three, four sessions, notice how he is calm and accepting this. And he did um, more than 20 sessions and he's functioning so much better now. Now this boy is the seven year old boy. He's very severe as well. He couldn't hand, he couldn't stand the uh, neurofeedback hookups. So he was screaming and kicking and pushing everybody, fighting for life to get out of this situation. The, and then after 10 sessions, look how he changed. He looks like a different person. By this time, um, he learned to know when his bladder is full so he can tell the teacher when he wants to go to the bathroom. He knows when to stop eating because he feels full. He doesn't run into the uh, traffic. Uh, so he really made a big, big uh, improvement. Um, and then let's go, let's just go back and talk about, um, let's see. So this is, uh, just a page explaining what my found what our foundation is educating autistic Chamai. And I'll come back to this. Um, now, another thing that you I don't know how much you know of autism. I worked with many, many autistic children using neurofeedback, so I really know quite a bit about them. But autism is a very, very um, strange um, epidemic. It is considered to be an epidemic worldwide. According to WHO, the rate prevalence, the rate of autism in population in Asian Pacific countries is considered to be one in uh, one child in 100 uh, school children. And that's compared to one in 68 in America, that's the uh, that's the prevalence number in, in, in the states. But it's, uh, it's very uh, little is known about autism. Number one, it is happening everywhere in the world. First, we thought it is limited to Western uh, industrial countries like America and Europe. Uh, but it's not. It's actually happening everywhere in the world. But the disease process or how it spreads out is not really well known. It's not infection. It's not like HIV AIDS where people get infected and they die. People don't die because of autism. But once you get autism, you are autistic for the rest of your life. And it costs a tremendous amount of money to look after one autistic child for life. Um, the condition, symptom of autism is varied. There's no 
two autistic people who look alike. Some of them are do not speak, like about one third of them do not speak. And one third of them have intellectual disabilities. Um, and three, um, three quarters of them requires care, uh, care for the rest of their life. So th the first it was diagnosed, it, that autism was diagnosed in, in 1940s in America and also in Vienna in Europe. But until then, this condition did exist, but it was hidden behind uh, mental illness, uh, uh, intellectual disability, and things of that nature. But it's only after the diagnosis in the 1940s, people started looking at the peculiar symptoms that's unique to autism. Uh, they have deficiencies in the three major areas. One is communication and language. Um, this is directly related to intellectual ability. Another one is social skills. They look like they don't care about other people. They care about things like somebody might be interested in some very narrow focused things like collecting trains. So some people have memories that they remember the number of um, climbers that climbed Mount Everest every year. And they show repetitive behavior sometimes, but they show problem behaviors that makes it difficult for them to live in the society. Like this becomes a big issue when, because we'd like them to go to school so that they can join the society and thrive as adults. But um, they, some of them have aggressive behaviors, they scream and shout, and they cannot control their emotion. And to make this even more complex is a lot of them have comorbidity. In other words, they have other illness as well. ADHD and epilepsy. Epilepsy has, ADHD is a new disease, just like autism is a new disease. It's all, all both a neurological disease. Epilepsy has been with us for centuries. There are many, many uh, archeological digs that digs up the skull of humans who might have had epilepsy where people try to put some hole through it so that bad spirit will escape from that person. And that's how before the diagnosis in a lot of rural areas, epilepsy, this kind of strange craziness was considered to be bad spirit. In Thailand, that is considered because it's a Buddhist country it's considered this is the um, bad karma. And a lot of them has the digestive system uh, problems and intellectual disability, as I mentioned, since they cannot communicate with others, they live in a very different world from the world we know. They have high level anxiety and depression, some of them. Um, now there's another thing that makes treatment, diagnosis, and testing of uh, autism very difficult is there's no biomedical diagnosis. You cannot take blood. You cannot check the heart monitor. There's no marker. There's, no, there's nothing biomedically can diagnose. It's all based on observations only. And observation, as you would imagine, is very subjective. You know, 10 person may observe 10 different things. Another thing is no known cause. We don't know how one uh, how um, autism that was prevalent in Western country. All of a sudden, we start seeing autism in uh, remote areas in the world. We don't know how that gets transmitted from one location to another, and we do know it's hereditary. Uh, it's there. However, there's about 200 to 400 genes involved in it. It's not a single gene hereditary disease like Down syndrome. So although we know it's hereditary, but we cannot say what the percentage of your child being autistic would be like. 
Another big issue is we don't have any medication directly addressing the autistic symptom. But there, there are doctors do Western, in Western countries, doctors do use different medication to address certain uh, symptoms, which is used mostly for psychotic uh, people. Um, now, let's just look at history of autism. Like I said, we don't know how long the history the you know, autistic symptom have been with us, but it's only after it was diagnosed that people started paying attention. It's in the 1940s, we start you know, USA and Austria, the first diagnosis. And we didn't know what was causing it, but we didn't know the cause, we didn't know the cure, but it keeps getting spread. There are more and more children that are diagnosed with autism in America. So back then, some psychologists decided it's a mothering style. And there was a, a phrase that was called refrigerator mother. It was because of the refrigerator mother, the autistic children are like that. But of course, it wasn't a case at all. Now, officially in 1980, the first uh, DS, DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, that is an international standard for diagnosing mental illness used throughout the world. The first entry was made into uh, DSM as an infantile autism. Uh, and then another big event in America is uh, in the Hollywood movie, it's called Rain Man, became very popular, got Academy Award, and everybody got to know what, rain, uh, what autism is like for the first time. And then in 2000, they wanted to find the cause, so they, decide, they started blaming maybe the vaccine was a cause, cause but it was not true. The, the doctor who claimed that had to retract that, and then the doctor lost medical license in the end. And another thing that is inflating the uh, prevalence rate of autism is 20, in 2013, DSM combined Asperger, PDD, not otherwise specified, and autism, and it called them, put them all together and called them autistic spectrum disorder. It's a combination of a lot of things. We don't, <clears throat> they have a similar symptoms, but we don't really know if this was really, it makes any sense to, to do that. Okay, let's just look at the prevalence, <clears throat> how popular, how frequent it is. In USA, in 2012, the prevalence one in 88. The latest one is one in 69, that's a lot. But prevalence is a very tricky thing, depends on how you, me how you measure this. In the US, USA data, is they measure this by the number of children who enter, who register to enter into school. And then they give a psychological, neurological testing and some get diagnosed as autism. But there are a lot of children who don't make it to school. So it's not really accurate data. In England, they do a different way of collecting data, and then they say that prevalence is one in hundred. And WHO says also says it's one in hundred. Um, now, autism is a very different thing when it goes into the low-income countries. Number one, diagnosis is not made often. In uh, rural uh, areas, it's only the very severe autistic child that gets to hospital. The parents would not travel many days to get to the hospital when the uh, symptom is not very severe, when they can manage the symptom. Especially here, we have to talk about the communities and family and culture. In the rural area, even in Thailand, there's a low uh, diagnosis of autism because the village in the rural area kind of integrate nonverbal autistic child who does little strange things as part of, oh, that's how he is. That's the kid he is and everybody kind of looks after him. It doesn't make it to a, such a big issue. 
However, in the big cities like Bangkok or uh, Chiang Mai or New York or Tokyo, um, they are really uh, driven by economy. And they want to make sure their children go to good school, make sure they will get a good job, they will have money and make good families. When they are invested on that, if their children do not start speaking when they're age four or five, they, it's a really big issue. And then uh, parents will take them to um, take them to hospital and get diagnosed. Uh, even the way of diagnosing is very different in, in each culture and each country. The diagnosis in America requires a four specialist. All of them agreeing that this is autism. In Thailand, it's one doctor who makes a diagnosis. I don't know in other countries where you come from how they are diagnosed. Um, no medication is available. So how do we help uh, those severe autistic children? Another thing is no service or training is accessible to most of these people because the parents don't have time to bring children to some service center or school or clinic or anything like that. They don't have the transportation. They have to work night shift. Therefore, they don't get to those services. And another issue I have to bring up is a stigma. Um, in Thailand, people tend to hide autistic children from society. They want to make them look like they have normal children. So they, rich family will pay a lot of money, put them into private school, put them through uh, the um, high school diploma and say, yes, our child graduated from such and such well-known famous school. So, but um, in the rural area, they believe this happened because of something you did in the past. That's in Thailand and in Africa and other Asian countries. I don't know what they believe in, but they don't believe in the medical theories. So for those um, low income countries, uh, there are some good news. First, it started out like in America, they spent a lot of money on research trying to find the cause and cure for autism. And but now the money is more going into educating and training autistics so they can be more so-called normal like everybody else in the society. But in the low income countries and the cities in, in the rural areas, getting diagnosis doesn't mean anything unless there's some follow up. So there's a rapid neural developmental assessment. That's the name, RNDA. This is a, really a sensational tool developed and used in, uh, well, first, first was used in Bangladesh. And with the lay people or the parents can learn to use this assessment tool and diagnose autistic children. And once they know their child is autistic, then it could be followed by parent skills training. This is the most, I think this is the hope for uh, low income countries because the only thing they have is parents. A school service center could be out of reach for them. If the parents learn how to work with autistic children, for example, to learn, if they learn skills to train their children to toilet train, then th there's a much bigger chance that this child can join the education, uh, uh, mainstream education. And then if they can get into public school, they have a chance to learn <clears throat> and thrive in that society. So it, to us, uh, we in, in, in Thailand, we want to do the same thing because there's a rural area, there are a lot of poor people. Um, so we want to, uh, we wanted to show to education teachers, schools, and then to the hospitals and doctors that there is neurofeedback that really works very well with the autistic children in mitigating the symptoms in such a short time. And I brought the machine to these areas and demonstrated to the teachers and school kids. And they, some of the school bought the machine with the donation of some government budget 
and train the teachers so they can be a self-sustaining neurofeedback center giving training to uh, poor families. And so we wanted to do that first and then to, tr to introduce Thai version of parent skills training. And that's the hope in the long run to uh, make any difference in the low income uh, children. And um, WHO um, and Autism Speaks, this is American Parent Advocacy uh, Foundation. They jointly developed and rolling out globally uh, of this uh, parent skills training. So if you are in one of those countries, uh, and if you think you can benefit from this service to train the parent, uh, these are the names you should contact. Um, so you can just copy this down. Now, um, I know I haven't really received any um, questions or any uh, voice coming up saying, hey, I don't understand what you're talking about, or can you slow down or whatever. So this is a great good time to talk, to give, uh, to uh, ask the moderator to connect with me. If you have some questions, you can ask. If you have a chat box uh, and wanted to type in something, you can do that. And if you would rather um, uh, want to connect with me uh, and email or any other way, just copy this down. This is my email address and this is our name. Um, and this is our website. So uh, you can find out more about what we did in Thailand. By the way, uh, one thing I need to say about Thailand is Thailand is not a big economy. However, it has a universal care healthcare system. And everybody who is Thai citizen is covered under, it, under this. And so they can go to the hospital, get diagnosed for autism, and if they're in the right hospital, they can even get the new feedback training for free. And they can go to special education center and be enrolled for free for daily uh, social care uh, classrooms and get uh, occupational therapy and uh, physical therapy training as well. Now, I think I spent pretty much the time I'm supposed to speak, but can I get some instruction from the moderator that if there's any questions and uh, are there any thing you suggest that I should talk more about? Uh, thank you so much, Keiko. Um, we, <clears throat> these questions are streaming in, but probably mm -hmm. we have two commentators as well, Dr. Namrata and Dr. Shivani. So we will listen to them and then let us uh, take all the questions probably towards oh. the end. So just a okay. few more minutes. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much, uh, uh, Keiko. So okay. um, this, yeah, the, the presentation was really insightful and uh, it's good that we probably all of us have uh, um, understood about autism and also those mm -hmm. who were not familiar with the burden and uh, autist, uh, autism. So this, it was very insightful for, for most of us, I'm sure. And uh, uh, this is a perfect stage to invite our commentators. And let us first listen to granddaughter of Shanti Devi Shankarji, Dr. Shivani Sharma Pandey, who gained insights in children with autism in Hong Kong. She's a senior dental mm -hmm. surgeon as well, with over mm -hmm. a decade of experience, and most recently was awarded the coveted fellowship in laser techniques as well. Welcome, Dr. Shivani. Over to you now. Hello, Dr. Shivani Sharma Pandey, are you there? Hello, I can't hear anything. Yes, uh, right. okay. We can hear you loud and clear now, and we can see your slides as well. Good. Over to you then. Hello. Hello, I am not able to hear anything. Can my audio be checked? Hello. 
Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Shivani Sharma, we can hear you uh, loud and clear. Your slides are... Hello, good evening. evening. Uh, I am Dr. Shivani from a very good afternoon, a very good evening, in fact, from India to Mr. Bobby Ramakant, Kiko, Dr. Namrata, and all the guests who have joined in today. I'm a dental profession, uh, professional, a dentist by profession, but I got to be uh, introduced to the disorder of autism when I moved to Hong Kong for a period of three years. And there I got to work for autistic kids for a bit of time. So I'm just sharing in very short about my experiences. Uh, basically, I'm going to highlight about the challenges that uh, I got to experience myself on uh, treating such children, being in touch with such children. And being a dentist, I would, in very short, like to uh, tell about the oral health problems in autism and what needs to be done in general. As Kiko has already told about the autistic spectrum disorder or ASD, it's basically a condition that is characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behavior, speech, and nonverbal communication, and it can be caused by a combination of genetic as well as the environmental factors. Uh, it's uh, unfortunate, but owing to the impaired social behavior, the autistic children often appear to be insensitive, uncaring, or self-absorbed. But it's important to understand that the indifference or the apparent lack of affection and non-compliance of instructions is not deliberate and willful. Um, Talking about the challenges, basically the challenges uh, uh, can be broadly social challenges, challenges related to the educational system, the educational setup, and of course, very important part of the financial challenges that the families or the caregivers of the autistic children get to face. So the first and the most important thing that I feel when I talk about the educational challenges is the lack of qualified and well-trained therapists and teachers, which was a common scenario while working in Hong Kong and when I tried to follow up the scenario back home in India as well. There's a reluctance by the schools to integrate the autistic children in the mainstream. They fill up the special needs quota with kids having physical disability and even if uh, the children are given an admission, often the autistic kids, especially those with verbal issues, are put in separate classes. The parents are often forced to admit their kids in special needs school, which actually deprives them of the company of normal kids who can actually be role models, someone to emulate, someone to inspire and look forward to so that they can also inculcate some th certain things because autism is mainly about certain differences. I mean, children are different from the rest of the children, but uh, the insensitive approach by the unskilled therapist was unfortunately a very common scenario that I got to notice while working in Hong Kong. And through the feedback of certain parents and the pe people working here in India as well for autistic children, I got to uh, collect the same reviews. The educational assistants of the shadow teachers were appointed to take care of the students in the class are mostly not trained or qualified because I am uh, really not aware of uh, uh, anything apart from the special diplomas that probably they do most I'm not talking in general I mean uh, but in majority of the cases what I have got to see is that they are not uh, as skilled and as uh, well trained and uh, because of this uh, in a particular classroom setup, the teacher has to focus on other students in the class and it and she feel, or, or he she or she feels that is the responsibility of the shadow teacher or the educational assistant who is taking care of the child to follow up certain things, certain things which are being taught to, in the class for to the normal children. It can, it, uh, I mean, they perceive that yeah, the shadow teacher or the assistant is taking care to see that the child can comprehend it or understand it. And as a result of this, many times there is no clarity and as to who is answerable for the child's progress. Consequently, the child keeps lagging behind in academics and the other aspects. The second important thing is the lack of acceptance by other children. People who need to understand that the behavior, as I earlier said, is not deliberate or willful. They find it very difficult to empathize or to put themselves in another person's positions or to appreciate their perception. 
As a result, their feelings are not tempered by the usual social understanding and norms. And now, owing to the impaired social behavior, the autistic children often appear uncaring, as I already said. But the parents uh, of the kids with ASD are denied of permanent residence in many countries, which was an eye-opener for me when I was discussing with one of my very close friends uh, about this scenario. I came to know that in many Western countries especially, which is very, very unfortunate, uh, the insurance agencies they do not give health insurance for autistic children in India, which is an issue I think which should be addressed to on priority because we know that for families or caregivers who are dealing with autistic children, there are huge expenses which they need to take care of. So there needs to be a proper policy by the government to take care of the financial assistance, whatever assistance can be provided for such children, for such families, so that they can also avail those therapies, those treatments, which as Kiko told, I mean, it was really so wonderful to know about the neurofeedback mechanism that she's using there. Uh, now for the parent or the caregiver who's devoting a huge amount of time and energy to support the child can often be at the cost of their own social life, their careers, their personal relationships and financial situations, which can actually lead to a sense of loss or grief and a lot of frustration in return. The child's autism impacts daily routine, their interfamilial dynamics, and the relationships of the whole family with the surrounding networks of their kins, their neighborhood, and the communities. Uh, I would like very short, in very short, I'd like to tell about the oral problems which are in autism. Uh, first of all, as we know, there are certain damaging oral habits in autistic children, which is bruxism, wherein they tend to clench their teeth out of anxiety, out of a lot of stress. There's tongue thrusting, certain masochistic habits in which there is self, self inflicting injuries, like they keep picking their gums and they keep biting their lips. Uh, in such cases, uh, we advise mouth guards if they can at all be tolerated by the children, because otherwise, in long term, it uh, really tends to have a lot of uh, negative impact on their oral health. As we know, when we talk about dental caries, as we know that oral hygiene is a very important aspect when we talk about dental hygiene, we should be taken care of. But because of uh, the, uh, the impaired compliance to instructions in case of uh, autistic children, often the oral health is uh, oral hygiene is compromised. So in such cases, uh, we would uh, actually request the parents or the caregivers to take pro proper preventive measures and um, increase the water intake and often try to uh, offer them alternatives to the karyogenic foods and beverages. As we know that uh, food and food items that tend to stick to the teeth uh, and a lot of sweet things that children often consume, they are highly karyogenic. So we can try to offer certain alternatives. And uh, as uh, Kiko had earlier discussed in her presentation that uh, autistic disorders are often associated with anxiety and depression. So the drugs in case uh, of such children which are administered, uh, uh, unfortunately, they lead to a decreased salivary flow. Mm, that's a side effect of such drugs, uh, which can lead to a lot of other uh, oral problems along with dental caries. The periodontal or the gum diseases uh, are also dependent a lot on the oral hygiene, so the caregivers or the parents should take care that proper oral prophylaxis uh, should be done with a regular dental checkup, which is quite uh, what I noticed is um, it's ignored to a, a large extent in such children. Uh, as we know that uh, in autistic children, a lot of milestones are delayed, so the tooth eruption is also often delayed. One of the very big reasons is, uh, as uh, we had discussed earlier in Kiko's presentation, that epilepsy is also associated uh, with uh, autism at times. So phenytoin, which is an anti-epileptic drug, which is uh, uh, given to such children, uh, often leads to gingival hyperplasia, which is a big reason for tooth eruption, delayed, sorry, to delay tooth eruption. Another aspect is trauma and injury, which is actually, um, I should say something which uh, we should uh, try on a war, I mean, uh, yeah, I can say for on a war footing, we should try to uh, consider that autistic children, as per my observation, they have a, a very bad assessment of risks. So they are very much prone to falls and injuries as a result of which um, there can be certain injuries which need urgent attention, immediate uh, attention by the parents, the teachers, their assistants, or the caregivers, whoever is taking charge of the child at that time. 
so i would really advise this caregivers to first of all try to learn beforehand before such an incident happens they should actually be aware and educated about the procedures that need to be followed if a permanent tooth is evolved or knocked out uh, in case of any injury uh, and they should try to locate any missing portions of the teeth because it often happens that the children that the child un, uh, being unaware may aspirate a part of the broken part of the tooth uh, so a, a, an immediate uh, chest x-ray should be done to find out that uh, no such broken uh, fragments have been aspirated now uh, i would just like to discuss in very short about what needs to be done for artists in general first of all is building of support system which is very very important because as we can uh, very well see that an active association of parents and caregivers needs to be there wherein uh, it forms a common platform where they can share their concerns um, and uh, share their experiences and derive a lot of information uh, and awareness about each other's uh, children there has to be a focus on the child not to make them try to make them come at par with the normal children but to make them fit better into the chaotic world uh, we need to have accessibility to a lot of augmentative communication techniques uh, uh, which is like supplementing the spoken language with gestures or uh, visual symbols to communicate the meanings uh, to communicate what is being tried to uh, uh, to be told to them uh, one of this is like a picture exchange communication system or the visual timetables uh, one such um, a tool is also the social stories which are often tailored to make the child more aware of the feelings and the intentions of others uh, we as i earlier said we definitely need to have more skilled workforce uh, skilled teachers and therapists to be appointed in schools and other places uh, where the children are be it home or school uh, from the education point of view definitely an individual education plan of the ieps need to be designed considering the individual uh, autistic child's indiv uh, strength and the areas where which needs to be worked on and last but not the least the financial policies the government uh, needs to frame certain policies for support and healthcare insurance for such children and i would really uh, like to request to use this platform uh, to um, convey that that is very 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 important thing at least in indian scenario to see that the government really makes such policies even as i came to know that a amount of 1 lakh or something is granted but that's not sufficient then it needs to be on a persistent basis wherein wherein, wherein they can really be benefited not just uh, for formality sake but of course for their uh, better life better quality of life and to provide a lot of comfort and hope to their parents family friends and the society in general thank you so much thank you so much uh, dr shivani sharma pande before we open for comments and questions we have saved an important voice to bring in unique and very important perspectives dr namrata j charles is amongst us uh, she is presently in kuwait dr namrata charles did her md in psychiatry from christian medical college vellore in india it's uh, one of the top prestigious institutes in the country and uh, worked in Christian Medical College Vellore in psychiatry department for several years. Her career took a major turn when autism influenced her life personally. We can never thank you enough, Dr. Namrata, for uh, your courage in sharing your expert and personal experience uh, on this uh, forum. Over to you now. Hello. Dr. Namrata, are you there? Hello? Dr. Namrata? Dr. Namrata, please is present. Hello. Dr. Namrata Charles, are you there? Looks like there might be some IT issue. Uh, Dr. Namrata Charles, are you able to? I can see you online uh, and you are not on mute as well. Dr. Namrata Charles. Okay, so may, maybe uh, in interest of time, probably 
we will move on to the question and answer question session sorry and uh, or comments as they are pouring in and uh, as soon as dr namrata charles comes back online we will uh, hear her voice as well okay so uh, well i have a question from i see a question, two questions streaming in from teresina CEO Nareen. Teresina, will you like to ask your question? I mean, I put it there already. Yes, Teresina. Please ask your question. Hello? Teresina? I, do I have the audio? Yes, you have the audio. You have the floor now. Teresina, CEO Nareen. Please introduce yeah, yourself please. and ask your questions. Yeah. Hi, thank you all for this opportunity. I'm Teresina, and I am involved in a, a parent support group in Trinidad in the West Indies. Apart from neurofeedback training, what other strategies are taught during your parent training sessions? This is for um, Kiko. Okay. Uh, and uh, Teresina, uh, uh, you, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, are you asking what kind of parent training do I have on mind? Is that your question? Um, apart from the neurofeedback training. Yes, what yes. Are, yes, um, okay. Yeah. I understand okay. your question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what I would like to... Um, I am familiar with the behavioral therapy, ABA, and I would like to teach, I would like to there are some technology developed using computers to teach the parents the basic skills of teaching their own children um, basic skills so that they can be included in different groups. That's what I'd like to train the teach uh, the, the parents. Did I respond to your question? Um. Hello, children with autism. Sorry. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, Teresina. I am. Hello, are yeah. you hearing me? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Each child, each child with autism is different. Therefore, um, if you um, use just one or two strategies, um, you may not reach all your children who have different um, issues on the spectrum. So, uh -huh. for example, at uh -huh. the Autistic Society in Trinidad and Tobago, what we do is um, parents are partners in the training and they learn a variety of uh -huh. strategies. So you find that some of the ABA may suit some children, maybe in uh -huh. the um, very young ones, and then you have to go on to other um, uh -huh. teaching strategies. Right. Visuals, et cetera. Yes, I, I understand your question. That is a problem. But what we plan to do, the some of the programs developed in Europe, is to teach parents to assess their children in terms of developmental stage. What's important is we cannot teach some children some cognitive skills while their sensory is not fully developed, for example. So to, to assess the child, what their developmental stage is, and then to really list, train yourself to see and hear better so that you understand your children better. So based on that, we will develop a program to teach that group of uh, parents uh, what to do, what, what the children need now, what level of training they're ready. Okay, yes, yes, we are. Yeah. individual we understand yes, yes i you. understand um another just broad question is because i'm um, looking at the theme of the webinar uh, children with autism on the blind spot and sustainable development agenda um i am thinking the, how can we influence our government to take autism spectrum disorders more seriously and assist with their um, therapies etc Right. I think that's a huge problem. I just <laughs> happen. 
I just <laughs> happened to walk into the right country where there's a universal care. Uh, Anybody who is a Thai citizen can go to public hospital, get major surgery, or get the diagnosis for autistic symptoms and get training. That's the system they have here. And, and based on that, that sounds um, very, that's an idea. It, it's it's yes, a really, that's really idea. And on top of that, they have um, a disability act where they say no children will be turned back. So all public school need to take in severe autistic children if they want to enter so that there is a program to develop special education teachers and inclusive classrooms in the public schools. So I work with special education center that trains the teachers in normal school to work with autistic children. And I also work with the hospitals to who diagnose autistic children. So I'm very lucky. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Teresina. We, Teresina, I know you have uh, another question on the dental issue. We will come back to you, but we have many questions pouring in and time is clicking out. Sure. We will come back to you, Teresina. Thank you. And uh, we have a question coming in from Neet, uh, ne Neeti Sharma. So, Neeti, uh, please ask your question now. You are on self mute, Neeti. So, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, my question is to Kiko. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please introduce yourself, Neeti. Sorry. Yeah. My name is Neeti, and I'm a parent of a girl on the autism spectrum. Uh, neurofeedback is something which I am I don't have much knowledge about. So I wanted to know if uh, uh, neurofeedback uh, is it designed for like specific needs of sorry, specific uh, Neeti, children? your voice is breaking in. It's designed for Hi, what? Yeah, Neeti, can you hear your me voice now? is breaking up. So as you have already typed in the question, I will just read it out for you. So sure. Neeti has typed in that uh, her question is for uh, Keiko. Is neurofeedback uh -huh. tailored to the specific need of each child? And is there a definite method to assess the improvement in specific areas? Thank you, Neeti. Okay. Over to you, Keiko. Now. Thank, yeah. thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> there are basically two different types of neurofeedback machines. It's not about the design of the hardware, but it's based on different hypotheses as how brain works and how we can intervene. The system I use, I bought this system because anybody can use it. School teachers, mothers, village head, they can all learn to use this machine because machine, the software does it all for you. It, you don't need to diagnose with the other kind of machine, you need to be able to diagnose because it's a diagnosis that based on diagnosis, you need to choose the treatment plan protocol to, you know, what to do, where on the head to put the sensor and oh, how, God, how you spend that. So I chose, deliberately chose a system that anybody can use. And this system, the reason why anybody can use is whether you have autism, or ADHD or Down syndrome, sometimes diagnosis is not clear, even when it's given by a doctor. But mm -hmm. no matter what the, what the diagnosis is, you can use the same program because it, it gives a feedback to the child's brain and the brain receives the feedback, makes its own decision how to change the way it connects. So it's not like I'm not a doctor who is telling this is child brain how you should change, how to be more like normal, which is what the other, um, uh, other type, type of a neurofeedback machine does. That requires a medical person to handle the, handle the machine. And then the medical person needs to make a lot of uh, decisions on her own to decide what treatment to decide. Thank you, Keiko. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Thank Namrata Charles, are you there? Dr. Namrata? Okay, so. All right, so. Uh, probably let's move on to the next question. There's another question, Keiko, which uh, for you, probably, which has streamed in. 
now it it says that kiko you said three fourth children with autism require care for rest of their lives so one fourth do not need care as they uh, so is it because they become better is it possible to increase the number of children with autism who may not need lifelong care i didn't understand the first part of the question would you repeat that again yes uh, the the uh, the center says that uh, you uh, in your presentation you said three fourth children with autism do not uh, sorry they do require care for rest of their lives so one fourth I, probably do not need care so how to increase the number of uh, children who do not who may not need lifelong care um let me answer it this way everyone benefits if they get neurofeedback training because neurofeedback will assess the software will assess what's happening in the child's brain and then gives that information to the software and software analyzes and find the new uh the connecting pattern that is repetitive and that's when the child decides oh i don't need to be doing it all the time i can be a save a lot more energy i can be more comfortable naturally brain just like any other animals like to be more comfortable wants to be safe so they will choose that way and when they learn oh i don't have to use so much energy be comfortable then they never want to go back to the old way that's why the once you give the treatment it stays with that child right thank you thanks for this uh, probably dr namrita is here now dr namrita are you there hello hello yes dr namrita hello? charles we can hear you yes P please go ahead dr namrita we can hear you clearly please go ahead Speaker. hello we can hear you we can hear you dr namrita we can hear some voices from your end too Dr. Namrata, are you there? All right. Probably, let's hope that uh, we are able to hear her later. Uh, Shri Raj has uh, sent in a comment that there is no effective policy on autism children in few states of government of India. Uh, and Kaiko has already uh, emphasized on uh, in the earlier resp her response that uh, you know we need to uh, work with the government for a better care program for autism. Uh, what is this? Cream on your face. Dr. Namrata, uh, are you there? Hello? All right, sorry, sorry for this interruption. So uh, we have few questions streaming in for Dr. Shivani, probably. Shivani Sharma is online. So uh, there are two related to you at least, and one from Teresina. Dr. Shivani, that uh, one question is, our hospitals are already overburdened. Pediatric OPDs and wards all are also overburdened. Is it just an issue of additional training on autism? Or do we need more human resource or new specialities which is skilled for caring for autistic children? Uh, well, am I audible? Yes, clear. Uh, OK, so I, I would like to say that I think that just uh, like we have uh, uh, the issues related to education when we talk about education then we definitely need and we do uh, have a special therapist a special workforce which is there to deal with the children with autism so similarly i think in the hospitals also we need we certainly need to have a specialized uh, trained professional who are there to take care of autistic kids uh, for uh, for autism as well as for um, other i mean for aut autistic children uh, not only from the dental point of view but for other related disorders that they are dealing with thank you and uh, there's another related question that uh, that you probably raised the issue hello the i can't hear you hello all right yes is it okay better now hello 
हेलो यस इज इट बेटर नाउ हेलो हेलो या सो देयर इज अनदर क्वेश्चन दैट यू रेज द इशू आई कांट हियर ऑन माय कंप्यूटर आई एम यूजिंग अ फ्रेंड्स फोन टू हियर द कन्वर्सेशन ओके we can hear you clearly uh, so Hello. i hope that you are able to hear us as well yeah so the question is that thanks so you raised the issue on uh, that oral hygiene is often compromised especially in children with special needs is this aspect included in training or medical curriculum no unfortunately it's not it's just okay. not All right. So that is another area where uh, probably more work needs to be done. Uh, Teresina, are you yeah. ready with your question for uh, dental aspects for Dr. Shivani Sharma Pandey? Teresina, are you there? Who? Oh, Teresina uh, from West Indies. Well, was, yes. It was just that. Um, well, caregivers need to start taking their children before any dental issues to just visit the dentist, sit in a chair or his chair. meet you know the environment get accustomed to the environment or if it's in a hospital setting so we encourage our parents i'm a parent as well to use like social stories etc before they they go out to visit so you know you, you start preparing them for these changes so that they are not frightened when they have to go to the office thank you right. all for this opportunity yeah thank you teresina for sharing that thank you thanks all right okay so uh, there is one clarification question from uh, rahul rahul yeah over to you now hello uh, i just wanted to know thank uh, i would like to thank the panelists for the uh, informative presentations it was indeed very helpful and uh, uh, i just wanted to know uh, i mean there is um, uh, um, dyslexia and uh, autism so is it uh, the same thing and uh, their symptoms are same or different and how uh, can be di di diagnosed dyslexia it is also quite prevalent and common yeah who, who is this question for uh rahul Ra is a journalist with cns here yeah. okay so he is basically asking is uh, 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 dyslexia and autism same Keko, should we take yes, this okay. on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Autism is much bigger um, area than uh, dyslexia. Dyslexia is included as part of the learning disability. And then, yes, if you use. I have an experience of using a new feedback. with the lot of learning disability children dyslexia was one of them they respond very well okay yeah thanks and uh, we have already run uh, over time but uh, just to check doctor if doctor namrita charles is audible to all of us doctor namrita are you there doctor namrita charles हेलो डॉक्टर नम्रता इज देर एनी अदर क्वेश्चन एनी अदर कॉमेंट फ्रॉम एनी ऑफ द पैनलिस्ट वी हैव ऑलरेडी ओवर शॉर्ट द टाइम सो थैंक्स अ लॉट फॉर स्टेइंग ऑन सो डॉक्टर नम्रता आर यू देयर विथ चेकिंग वन मोर टाइम All right, probably the IT issue is not uh, letting us hear yeah, the perspectives. Yeah, I managed to clear Dr. most of my. Doctor Namrata. Yeah. Okay. We can hear some voices from her hand, but probably she probably is unable to hear us. Anyways, so we will hear have her in other sessions. So uh, thanks a lot, Keiko Samuels, uh, Doctor Shivani Sharma, and. Uh, all the participants uh, the session was very insightful this lecture also got streamed on youtube recording and audio podcast will be made available to each one of you very soon till we meet again for next month's sgm health justice lecture goodbye and uh, best wishes thank you thanks a lot goodbye thank you. goodbye thank you